Hi, Dr. David. This is Dr. David's uh, live webinar, uh, typically talking about co-occurring addictions, but he is a wealth of information on lots of things. And please tell me we're not talking about patients tonight. That's all I care about. So I was going to roll that out just for you, but I decided not to do that. <laughs> I'm no, getting I know, better. I, never, another, I do other stuff as well. So yes, I know you do. So yeah. I do. So yeah, so. So, but before I start, I want to, if, if okay. you have questions about what Dr. David is talking about or anything in, within this field, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen um, and we will ask um, them. Uh, the, you can ask as an anonymous attendee if it would be helpful for us to know if you're the addict or if you're the betrayed partner, if discovery was, you know, uh, three weeks ago or three years ago, like some little brief thing. Um, please feel free to include that as well. So, um, but we'll, we'll make sure we get to those shortly, but Dr. David, what do you got for us tonight? Yeah. So I always start with about 10 minutes of talking about a topic. And um, yesterday I had the pleasure of being on the alumni, one of our alumni groups. We have two official and actually a third that the client started. So we have three really active alumni groups every week. And uh, there's usually a staff member on. I'm on once a month. Dr. Rob will be on next week on Tuesday. But there are 40 some guys. It was great. I love those meetings. But what I was observing are some symptoms of what we call post acute withdrawal syndrome. And I think it's something that we haven't talked about in a while. And I thought it might be useful for people to kind of explore some of that because there are certain things that happen a week, a month, two, three months down the road that are kind of predictable that uh, are subtle. Um, or that may, people may not even associate with what's going on. And so I kind of want to review what we call this thing called post-acute withdrawal syndrome and, and talk about what it is in general. It was discovered, first of all, for more drug addiction kinds of stuff, but it, it exists for sex addiction as well and what it looks like and more importantly, what we can do about it. So, so let me just cover that really quickly. Um, basically, it, this started by observing drug withdrawal, drug addicts in recovery. And we know that, of course, drug addicts uh, drugs specifically, more uh, alcohol, opioids, among others, have withdrawal symptoms that are very, can be very dangerous, but they're, they're quite physical. And, but once those more extreme physiological symptoms end, there are more subtle emotional things that go on for quite a while, sometimes days and weeks. And so we've really started to identify those very specifically for alcohol and drugs, but they've been more subtle for sex and porn addiction. And so I think um, we want to talk about that. Now, this is, by definition, post-acute withdrawal can last up to six months. So that's the kind of time horizon that we're talking about from, from sobriety date through six months. It's not an official medical diagnosis, but it's a very commonly observed phenomenon. And anybody in addiction will be familiar with the term pause or post-acute withdrawal syndrome. So at first, it's been around since the 1990s, we first noticed it, and it's really only gotten more, more um, more data points really since then. So in terms of porn and sex addiction withdrawal, what does that look like? You know, in the first 48 hours, what do we see? Um, typically, it starts to emerge with a lot of irritability, a lot of grumpiness. There's a lot of mood swings. People are up, people are down, people are right on edge. There's a lot of anxiety that can go into tears. It can come flash back into anger. It's kind of people are all over the place. What, what a therapist call very labile, right? The moods are up, the moods are down, a lot of mood swings. Um, there can be physical symptoms as well. There can be headaches. Um, there can be uh, a lot of cravings, uh, cravings that kind of come out of nowhere, really strong temptations to look at porn. Um, there's something called in porn called the seven day craving. So sometimes in the first 72 hours, it, it can kind of peak and, and subside. Sometimes there's this like seven day thing and it varies from individual to individual. My point is that don't be surprised if you're doing fine, you know, you think, man, I got this. And suddenly out of the blue, you have a really strong craving that seems to come from nowhere. That's pretty normal. And it doesn't mean you're not doing everything you should be doing. Um, but it certainly means you should take a look and make sure you are doing everything you should be doing. But but it's it's kind of normal. So that's the first week, first 48 hours for the first week. After that, we start to get in the, this other kind of face that's in this, this almost like a zombie-like state in some people. Like people kind of get in this zone where they're kind of flat, um, kind of emotionless, kind of disconnected, um, not feeling much of anything. They're not having their high from the dopamine kick from the porn and sex addiction anymore. So they're they're missing that 
um, euphoria, they're missing the intensity, they're missing the excitement, and all they have is kind of the, uh, uh, that, that kind of low feeling, low energy levels, um, oftentimes an inability to focus. We know there's a high rate of correlation between actual ADHD and sex addiction, but at those moments, even if you don't have ADHD, you're going to feel like you do because it's, it's just really hard to focus for a month or two in there. And there's a lot of reasons for this. This is like brain chemistry stuff. The, the brain is going through some adjustments as it's kind of coming back down to earth after being shot up into you know, the stars with all the intensity of, of the acting out. Um, there's a lot of um, low sex drive, oftentimes sex drive goes away. And, and I think that's kind of a blessing. It just kind of takes it off the table. You're not worried about it for the most part. Eventually you have to deal with it when it comes back. But, but then also there's a sense of sometimes of loneliness, being disconnected, of kind of being kind of all alone in the world. And, and then also remember that sex and porn addiction often are used to kind of fill in for um, feeling awkward. And so when we take those away, people start to feel kind of awkward, socially awkward, not knowing what the right, to, like we don't quite fit in our bodies, right? Everything's kind of not smooth and easy. Um, and then from day 30 out uh, up to about day 90, as I mentioned, and as I said, this can go on for six months, although I don't, it, it really starts to fade out after day 90. But I would say kind of random temptations, and then still these random outbursts of emotion, right? These mood swings, sort of temper tantrums, literally um, uh, insomnia. I remember my sponsor, I'm not a, a sex addict, a recovering drug addict, alcoholic here, but I remember my sponsor for the first like friggin' two years saying, nobody ever died of lack of sleep. And I, I swear I didn't sleep at all for two years. So a lot of insomnia. Um, for all this, and a lot, of, a lot of depression. And the depression is almost hardwired into the brain of an addict in recovery, because uh, with sex and porn addiction, as well as amphetamine addiction, uh, the brain has gotten used to very high levels of stimulus to feel normal. And without that stimulus for a while, you're going to feel depressed. And that, again, the brain is marvelous in its ability to kind of readjust, but it's going to take time. Um, so, so to summarize some of the symptoms we may see in different stages, this irritability, even downright hostility sometimes, um, depression, anxiety, mood swings, low energy, a lot of fatigue, a lot of kind of fogginess, mental fogginess, um, sleep disruptions, insomnia, uh, inability to focus or think clearly, and, and so on. So um, what do we do? Uh, I think the first thing we need to do is really educate ourselves about what withdrawal from sex addiction looks like. I think a lot of people think, well, there's no such thing. And yeah, there is. Uh, and I think anybody that's gone through it may not even identify it as such, but they certainly know, know how, how it feels. So I'm trying to put a name on it tonight and, and let you know that it may extend for a while in kind of subtle forms or not so subtle. Your partner may not think it's so subtle at all if they're suddenly hit with an angry outburst. Um, uh, in other words, I th the other two thing too in, in early recovery, I think we have to really celebrate every accomplishment. You know, and I, and I, I've had people say, you know, we if in every group in my chem sex of worker group interviews nights, if somebody has, you know, nine days clean, I clap, I clap, say congratulations. It's a big deal, and I think we never should minimize how often we can say good job if we're do, if we're sober today, right, and do that day count. So I think really not to minimize those accomplishments that we do, the, the successes in our relationships or moving forward in therapy, those benchmarks, whatever we do, I think it's really important to take note of that and, and do it. But at the same time, to really start to learn patience with ourselves and patience. And by the way, partners, patience for the addict as well, because I think this is a long process. The, in many cases, um, the addicts and fr frankly, the partners are, are learning many skills that they probably never had before. And, and I think to learn how to relate, to learn how to feel and express those feelings and, and take those chances of being vulnerable and all that takes time. And so patience is a really important thing that can minimize the risk of some of those pause symptoms kind of acting up. Um, find a natural way to help with sleep problems. You know, sleep is a really big problem. Uh, there's a whole research field on what we call sleep hygiene. Um, and there's really simple techniques. One, put your phones down an hour before sleep at least. Uh, that blue light from phones, any light from phones is very stimulating on the brain. Um, don't watch TV, don't watch the news, don't drink, don't eat, um, keep your bedroom dark, keep it cool, 
don't use your bed for stuff besides sleep. Uh, you know, people do their work, they eat meals, they, you know, sometimes somehow for our bed is just kind of our bedroom or for sleep and insects, that's what it is. And so um, that's that kind of sleep hygiene thing is really important to, to take care of ourselves. Going to bed at the same time every day, all those things are kind of natural ways to kind of improve that sleep stuff. Exercise. Exercise is really important. Our bodies uh, crave some of the amino acids that exercise can throw off. Uh, so for example, the, the dopamine transporters that have been severely damaged by our addictions, so whether it's sex or porn or drug addiction, need those amino acids that are the result of exercise to heal, to rebuild. And so exercise is great. Exercise is good for your mood, your body. Uh, the only caution, a little footnote here, uh, as intensity addicts, people sometimes have a habit of overdoing it. So just be careful about transferring your addictive tendencies to um, your, your, your exercise. And healthy diet. You know, it's, it's also very common to transfer our compulsive nature to complex carbohydrates and all kinds of good food and rewarding ourselves for stuff. And so just be careful about food as well and try to eat as healthy as you can. Um, be careful of co-occurring disorders in speaking of that, right? I think it's easy to kind of start maybe drinking a little bit too much or maybe gambling or we just, it's so easy to transfer addictions. It's so just really on alert for that because um, your body's going to, and your mind is going to be craving to like transfer that addictive impulse to something else. Um, and so finally, two things, managing impulse control, addiction, is all about managing those cravings, whether they're coming from inside or outside, learning how to manage those in really effective ways and how to defuse those triggers. And the best way to do that and the best overall strategy, I think, for recovery is connection. Really have the, the most robust social support networks you can have. That includes your recovery people, your family, your friends, just really strong connections. We know this is, this is literature-based. Uh, the, the stronger your connection, the stronger your recovery. And so I think that's the best possible way. So anyway, just a quick uh, overview of, of post-acute withdrawal syndrome. There you go. Thanks. Well, and it was interesting because I was thinking at the same time, you know, like they talk about the pink cloud and I thought, you know, because that can, that can last six months for people in recovery, but like this overlaps with that. But, and, you know, and, and you said something about, you know, partners being kind you know, to the addict or whatever you, however you said it. And I was like, and it, you don't even have to be kind, get out of the way, just understand that that's, you know, some of the stuff that's going on and it isn't you, it's them, um, yeah. uh, you know, so, so it, it isn't personal, but you, you know, yeah. I mean, it's like, um, uh, you know, if anybody's ever drank too much coffee and then they try to cut back or stop or have to go have a medical procedure and not drink it, you know, like you get a headache, you get grumpy. I mean, all of those things, you know, it's real, right. um, you know, um, and it's not an excuse. It's a reason. Um, um, you know, you're talking about the sleep and nobody ever died from lack of sleep. And I was like, you know, yeah, the, the studies, you know, really, you know, um, I think as addicts, we are so bad at taking care of ourselves on a global basis, or we do one thing really good, like we exercise. So therefore we're, you know, we're taking care of, you know, so, so really looking at everything holistically. And, and I see so many people that do switch, you know, or, or use the, well, that one's not as bad. Like, you know, so I, I've stopped the worst one, but, but you're continuing, like you said, the dopamine. And so you're never really addressing the, you know, the deeper wounds that are at the root of all of this, you know, so, you know, then it's like, okay, well, you know, th then that one's going to be a problem. So you have to address that, you know, and it's just this, you know, the whack-a-mole yeah. of, you know. And if I could just elaborate on that, even something as simple as nicotine, which we've talked about a lot, right? So if I'm a sex or porn addict or even alcoholic and I give all that up, but I continue to smoke cigarettes, even that nicotine levels will keep me disconnected from a level, a layer of feelings that I need to be able to connect to to really move into my recovery. It just, it still is inaccessible to me, even with something as, you know, um, benign as cigarettes, which we know it's not. But, but I mean, so that's just, it's, it's so important to be really pure in that regard. Yeah. And, and it can feel overwhelming, you know, to try to stop everything at once, you know, but, sure. I'm, you know, and, and so yes, getting, getting a plan and, but what you talked about with connection, it, it really is, you know, I, like if I'm connected with other people, you know, my cravings are, you know, going to go down. I, I think it's also, 
like I, you know, I hear this often, read this often of like, or like in my Facebook recovery groups and stuff, but it's like, I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't stand it. And I had to go act out. And I was like, no, because now you're on Facebook feeling shame about, I just relapsed. And had you reached out to any one of the thousand people on this group, you know, beforehand, but I, I, I feel like we get caught in that, like the craving is so intense. And if we don't have a plan for, it's going to happen. If we don't have a plan for how we're going to manage that, you know, it, you know, all bets are off. So, so, so I think when you're talking about this, you know, having, looking at everything and going, okay, I'm going to experience you know, disruption, I'm going to have some sleeping. So here are the things I can do. I can, you know, shift my, you know, bedroom hygiene and my night times, you know, I can right. choose healthy I food. And, you know, I mean, I can do, these are the things I can manage. I can't manage when, you know, when I get a bad craving, but I can go, then I'm going to call a friend, you know, so having a plan for how I'm going to manage it, you know, and just know that, you know, like everything, it's like that craving happens, those, that, anger flares up, you know, or whatever the discontent, but it goes away, you know, it's temporary. So. Exactly. And I think just to, to follow up on that plan thing, we talk to our clients about this all the time. When that craving hits is not the moment to try to invent a plan. <laughs> yes. That plan has to be in existence and practice before that, because at that moment it needs to be just a muscle memory response to put it into action, right? At that moment, you're so kind of flustered. You can't think of what to do. I, I used to write it down so I could like, okay, yeah, that's it. And make a call. So um, yeah, you just be able to jump, jump into action at those moments. Yes. Back in the olden days, we had paper I know, and we had it in our pockets in my wallet. and we would call yes. on a landline that was connected to a wall. So like, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we can have the list on our, yeah, we can have the list on our calendar of like, you know, here's, here's my, it's an emergency plan. What's my emergency plan, you know, so right. that when this happens. So, exactly. so Dr. David, uh, there's a question addiction interactions. I have found my work addiction, oh, a huge stumbling block for my recovery. I often disproportionately exhausted after work, like I'm coming down off of a drug. No. I often choose work over home, especially when I'm struggling with my relationship and recovery work. At work, I get affirmation, control, and power. At home, I face the consequence of my choices. I feel like a failure. Where can I gain insight into this interactive addiction I have and get tools to pick up to pick home over work. Thank you for asking that great question. You know, and boy, I'll say, and this kind of captures the whole essence of this, this issue. And, and I just want to say, we always warn our clients because, you know, sex and porn addiction is, they're both intensity addictions and, and so is work. And so it's very common for people when they give up their sex and porn addiction to look around for someplace to put all this energy and, and activity and work, as you say here, is a, is a socially validated activity. What, if we work you know, 80 hours a week, people say, boy, he's a hard worker, <laughs> instead of saying he's, that his life was really out of balance. So I think um, to recognize this is really important. And I, and I think what, what is happening is that you're really just transferring that, that addictive impulse into an area and it, there's a temporary feel good you're getting a dopamine rush. You're getting, by the way, a lot of adrenaline too. Uh, there's a lot of adrenaline and stress hormones that are also part of the addictive process here. But so you're getting that, plus you're getting validation, you're getting award, you're probably getting financial rewards. And so it's all very tempting because it also just removes us, it whisks us right out of our emotional lives. And so um, I think just, first of all, you have the awareness of it, which is great. I think now you need the kind of tools and, and also, by the way, control and power. And I think also sex addiction, as we know, is all about control and power uh, in many cases. So, I mean, you've really nailed it. And I think that that level of insight is really fabulous, actually, that, that you understand it so well. Now, what to do about it? Um, you say you face the consequences of your choices. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I would guess that at home, there are feelings, there's emotions, there's interaction with people, uh, loved ones that there may be consequences, you say. And so I think that's, that's certainly by, you know, the tougher choice, right? If you can just go and dive into work and kind of lose yourself in that, uh, that's a much easier choice. So I think boundaries, I, that's kind of the, the, the approach I would take here is boundaries, set a limit, give yourself a, a limit on work hours a week. Um, and I would be 
realistic but not excessive you know i'm 40 maybe tops 45 i don't know what kind of work you do but but i mean at that point if you're really going to seriously do your recovery activities which i believe probably need to be daily and at least an hour and if you talk about commute time or phone time you're maybe talking a couple hours a day there's not a lot of time for work and all those excess hours so i think again the tools to use here um, your connection and your recovery groups. I think I would talk to your sponsor about this. I would talk, if you're in any kind of men's group, this is a very common phenomenon that a lot of men have to struggle with because I think, especially in this culture, men are kind of hardwired to view their success in terms of their work life and their income and their hours and their validation they get from all that and their power and control. So it's, I mean, it's a really, it's, it's like um, bait out there kind of luring you into that into that environment so what it, what is it going to take it's going to take the willingness to kind of calm down slow down and feel feelings and deal with whatever's at home you know addicts are avoiders we avoid that's our i think my instinctive impulse uh, certainly i think every addict i've ever met we kind of avoid dealing with stuff and so um it's time to kind of take it into bite-sized pieces and, and face Face things at home, and then there's a, you know, just there's a ton of recovery tools to do that. But um, I think just that's I would just really make a commitment, get help from it. This is not the sort of thing you can probably do by yourself. I would actually get an accountability partner for your work hours, so you can talk to somebody about it and and report to somebody. Because until we maybe get shamed into like not doing as much, we're probably not going to change. So I would really kind of publicize this to your friends, get some help with it. And, and start making some changes. Tammy, any thoughts on, on that one? Yeah, I do, because you know, it, 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 has been, it has been a struggle for me too. Um, uh, there's an online assessment uh, that gauges work and, um, and money stuff. And the, the work was always a red line. And, you know, and I would work on it and I'd go, oh, I must be doing better. And I'd take the test again and it would be like slightly better. So, so it has been, you know, a struggle, um, uh, but, but, yeah, I, a couple things. First of all, at the end of life, I am confident no one goes, gosh, I wish I had worked more. I'm so glad I worked so many hours, you know, so, so like have the long-term vision. Things are uncomfortable at home. What happens if you started, you probably freaked out when he said 40, 45 hours. So let's just start with that. So, so, but like, you know, can you be more efficient at work? Can you, you know, can you do things differently so that you get the work done? Lots of people, you know, have time where they're not really as productive. So I bet you can. And what happens if, if the conversation at home was, I, you know, I am really committed to this relationship. I want to um, help repair the relationship. I am committing to being home at 530 at night and that we're going to spend time. I'm also going to do my recovery time. And, you know, you might do a noon meeting, you know, or something like that, you know, break up your work day. Um, I personally love those, you know, but, you know, how can you take a whole calendar, be really methodical, but I'm scheduling, this is my recovery work and not when you're exhausted and the family doesn't get the leftovers. The, the house doesn't get the leftovers of like, okay, now I'm exhausted from work and I got all my attaboys at work and, and now here I am, I'm home, you know, what more do you want? So, so, but I, you know, I can't help but think that a partner if somebody comes to them and says, you know, I'm committed to this, it's going to be difficult for me, I, I'm going to do my best, I may not do it perfectly, but I'm going to hold accountability, you know, um, uh, th that they would go, wow, this is a shift, you know, um, that somebody's stepping into that space. So it might shift, you know, just, just you showing up differently, you know, so that well, was kind of my thought. One, one more thing, I just was reading that again, there's a, he states, I feel like a failure at home. Right. And I think I would kind of try to reframe that, you know, work is obviously is in kind of an easy win because of the, you get the, the, the attaboys and the, and the adrenaline and all the, the dopamine work. Um, sometimes at home, it's not as easy in recovery, especially early recovery. So, but I would really try to identify the successes, even if it's a tough one, even if it's um, not uh, an ideal one, but there's, there's got to be successes in your day at home. Uh, even if it's a day of, of sobriety, uh, start adding gratitude into your, your list at home. I'd really try to reframe that home experience and your recovery experience in more positive ways, because it sounds like you've almost set up this, like it's either wonderful, exciting, or terrible and awful. And just, I think I wouldn't be quite so black and white with that. I'm going to read this because I, um, uh, Harriet Hunter's Miracles of Recovery, um, 
this was so this was uh, from the 25th, but this was so appropriate. I bookmarked it, but this is called getting out of our comfort zone and uh. and you're in your comfort zone right now. So um, and I won't read the whole thing, but each day in recovery, we have we seek opportunities to face our fears by doing life differently. We know whatever reminds us of ease and comfort is the guys called stinking thinking, which is, you know, an AA term. Um, but I, it probably goes across the um, 12 steps. Staying outside of our comfort zone is where personal growth thrives. We honor ourselves as we rise above routine situations replete with cunning, baffling, and powerful traps to hold us back. When we're out of our comfort zone, we conquer our fears, taking control and grow in courage by doing it anyway. Otherwise, we remain stuck in negativity and immature thinking. I love that. I did too, obviously, because I, you know, like I was like, oh, I have to re remember that one because, yeah, it's really easy to, you know, you're comfortable at work, you know, I, clearly. So the uncomfortable is going to be, you know, um, but, but, but the, you know, the, the meaningful stuff is the relationships. It's the people that love us and that we really love. We just haven't figured out how to, you know, step into that space as, as much, but I love that you're asking the question. And trust me, there's support for that too. So, okay. Next question. I began to notice after these months of recovery that my PASA husband has spent our 11 years of marriage in taking steps to minimize me, overwhelm me, ignore the things I wanted or asked for, et cetera. When I would work hard to help him, he blamed me for being a bully, only caring about money, et cetera. Um, lots of verbal abuse, name calling. Is this typical behavior for addicts? Um, well, I'm sorry that you've endured that for such a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, this is abuse, right? And this is, this is unfortunately what we see sometimes as life with an active addict. Um, addicts, almost by definition, deflect blame, deflect responsibility, uh, make excuses, rationalize, um, point to other people to as, as rationalizations for their behavior, um, minimize their own culpability. So yeah, I mean, all this is pretty, pretty classic, actually. Um, including kind of the overwhelm, the, the power and control stuff, right? And so, um, yeah, I think this is pretty classic. And so I, I think there are a couple of things, I'm not sure what, where you're at right now or where your um, addict partner is at, but certainly he, he or she could certainly find benefit from some recovery activities and uh, program. I think if it's gone on for 11 years, I think Probably that almost by definition, we look at we're looking at some kind of residential treatment program to to break through some of that. But for you, more importantly, um, there's a lot of support there for you. And I I would encourage you to if, if you haven't already, and I suspect you've started if you if you found your way here tonight, um, to really explore some of the resources out there for betrayed partners because um, I think sometimes it's so confusing if you've been gaslit and spun around and turned upside down and you don't really know what the truth is after a while or what you're, what you're seeing. If, you know, it just gets so confusing and disorienting. So I think to kind of step out of that swirl and, and try to step into some um, support with other people who've been there and, and can give you some validity for what you're experiencing and also more importantly, some tools to help you sort of um, get some resources for you so you can take some action on your own behalf. And that, that's gonna involve setting some boundaries for yourself. And it may be taking some action that, that require, you know, interrupting this whole process and removing him or you or from the home separation. I'm not sure what that's up you know, to you and perhaps a therapist. I would really encourage you to get a CSAT if you don't have one, uh, that CSATs are trained to really understand this, this whole addiction and especially the result of uh, as the impact on, on partners and the betrayal process there. So anyway, there's there's hope out there. I think you this is you've nailed it. This is absolutely a case of, of sex addiction. That's almost classic. And so there's a lot of help out there and resources uh, for you. Uh, so I hope you can stay connected. Uh, Tammy. You... So uh, resources out there are great resources right here. You found your way to yeah. this. Great. Yeah. But there's 
you know, trade partner group tomorrow morning. Um, Elizabeth is subbing in for Natalie tomorrow morning. Um, uh, and then Troy Love does attachment wounds alternating Thursdays. And I can't remember if he's on tomorrow or if uh, Jonathan Taylor is, but regardless, so lots of free resources, drop-in groups and, and these webinars on sexandrelationshiphealing.com. You'll also hear podcasts, but, but what Dr. David said about boundaries, it, yeah, absolutely setting you know, healthy boundaries for you. It, it, it really, because when you met him, um, you know, I am confident he was charming and whatever and treated you nice. And then you got married and all of this started happening and, but it, you know, probably slowly and insidiously. And so, so it's one of those where, you know, like had it happened right away, you might've gone, oh, that's bullying. The addicts are really good at manipulating, you know, the, the situation and getting what they want and, and blame shifting and, and bullying. I mean, unfortunately in active addiction that, you know, that is, that can be part of it, never acceptable. Um, uh, so you having healthy boundaries for you. We have work groups for both of you on, on the Seeking Integrity site. Um, there's a Betrayed Partner work group. That's a six week long work group. So it's the Psychoeducation Live Facilitated. Angela Spearman um, is doing that. But um, uh, that one starts again on June 1st. But we have Sex Addiction 101, Porn Addiction 101. So you identify he's an SAP8. So the Sex Addiction 101 would be a really good starting place but then out of the doghouse because it's how do you rebuild trust i mean if he's sober then out of the doghouse because you know dr rob wrote in the book you don't have to do these things but if you want to be in this relationship then doing the these things you know is helpful and dr david mentioned residential treatment there is no more expert treatment you know than what um dr rob you know collaborating with dr david fawcett you know put together uh you know it's a very small milieu expert treatment, you know, they work directly with the clients and really hone in, not just on, you know, uh, like what I also read in this, um, besides the bullying for you, which again, is not okay, is, you know, there is a deeply wounded man who is, you know, acting out and blaming everyone else. And pr probably, you know, I, I don't know what his wounds are underneath that, but, you know, I hear a lot of brokenness. So, so there is healing. I know lots of people who, you know, in recovery, we're very different people. We can be people of integrity. We can learn to do, you know, we can learn to treat people correctly and, um, and, and with kindness and, and grace. And so, so we can learn, um, uh, but you said after these months of recovery, so I don't know where, you know, if he's very early in the process, it's, you know, it's a journey. So I don't, I don't know, you know, but the first step is stopping the behavior and then it's, you know, starting to, uh, to, to shift and change. But, you know, that, you know, that typically takes, you know, takes a, a while, you know, to get that. So other thoughts. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, we do see some of these kind of bleeding over into recovery. I think sometimes addicts continue to blame and um, play games a little bit. And to me, that's just a sign they need to tighten up their recovery. The extent of this though, and maybe it's just describing the duration over such a long period of time, but th these are these are pretty extreme. Uh, I don't hear a lot of recovery in here. Just no, no. And, and it was added in the chat was total love bombing at the beginning of the relationship. Oh, and that is pretty yeah. typical too. It's like, I, now I've got you. So now I'm going to, you know, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I, 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 I am sorry, but, um, but you having healthy boundaries, what do you need to do for your safety? Um, I'd encourage you to lean into that. So, okay. Next question. My wife has distanced herself from my um, from me after constantly feeling I was not invested enough. Now that she's done that, I have seen how close to losing her I am. I have dived fully into recovery and the work needed, but my wife is remaining distant. She doesn't feel it's safe for her to share her pain. How can I help her feel safe and move closer? This is so common. It's like, I, I, you know, we, we, while well, our treatment center often is like people who, where the partner has finally said, yeah, I've, I've done, I, unfortunately with addiction, we don't get it. And, and I say this often until the pain of change is less than the pain of staying the same. You've, you've now encountered that. So um, to me, this is, you keep doing the work. You, you, you can't make her come back. You do the work and show her that you're actually trustworthy. 
she can see you stand zero chance of getting her back if you don't do the work. And we have a treatment program. Did I mention that? We have a residential treatment program. We can help you. So, Dr. David. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I, very often, unfortunately, it, it comes to this, right? Because um, it takes what it takes to kind of shake the addict out of their, their denial and their kind of stupor, their this kind of fantasy magical world that addicts live in. Um, and, and to realize that uh, what they probably care about most, although they don't have to express it, they're about to lose. And so um, the thing here, it's frustrating, I know, because, and this is often kind of times the addict, and I see this in treatment, especially when we have guys there for three weeks, sometimes even four weeks, you can start to really feel this change going on within the addict. They're like getting it. They're, there's, in, in recovery, the Bible talks about a psychic change, and, but you can start to see that they're really starting to internalize it. And they want their partners to know that they're doing that right away, right? That their partners, they want their partners to acknowledge this change. And that's just not how it works because the, the partners been down this road before. <laughs> they, they've seen this before. They've gone through the, how many times have they been promised change? How many times have they been told it was going to be better? That was the last time it would never happen again. And, you know, and they believe it and the rugs pulled out again. That, that's, that, that's the trauma right there, that repetitive betrayal. And so of course, there's not going to be a rapid change. And, and that's why we make a distinction between an apology, which is just simply words, and how many times has an addict done that, versus an amends, which we, we put in terms of a behavior change. And, and you, can't behave, you can't change your behavior once and expect that all to be better. It's going to be consistent over time. And it's going to take a long time. And it's going to be on the partner's timetable, not the addict's timetable. And so I can't tell you what that timetable is. Everybody's different. And it may not ever be the same. Um, but but it, it, it is going to take a long period of time of you being predictably consistent and reliable and living in integrity and showing up and doing what you say you're going to do and being where you say you're going to be and just doing all that over and over and over again. And if there's some discrepancy, coming clean about it immediately or as soon as possible, and you know, all that stuff that we, that kind of clean recovery living stuff, that's what it's going to take. And, and there's no shortcut for that in my experience. And, and so um, that's the way. And the good news though, is that I've seen wonderful things happen again on the the alumni call and i can't tell you we now have guys that have been out nearly three years and and so we have people coming in with like some some with three years of recovery out there and they're talking about their marriages healing and you know people are families are getting pregnant and just the healing happens so i do i want to give that message as well people get better couples get better this sex addiction you can get better but it takes work and it takes time so just be patient and do your, just keep your nose clean, <laughs> do what you're supposed to do and, and mind your own business and hopefully she'll come around. Focus, focus on your recovery. Cause I, I hear this all the time, How, you know, it's like, you know, now I want to focus on her. And I was like, that's just another distraction. You doing your work, like Dr. David said, you doing the work, you you know, you being consistent. I tell this to partners all the time because they'll say, oh, he says he's in recovery. And I go, if his lips are moving and you're not seeing the action. And I think that's what happened with your wife is she was not seeing the action and, and the accountability. So, so do it, make sure that you are able to show her that you are changing. And again, you know, it, 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 it may be too late, but I hear often from people, I didn't have to lose, you know, my first or second or third marriage, you know, if I had just done this work and, and it, it, it's true. If we actually show up and do the work, you know, we can change and, 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 and we can heal. We stand no chance of being, I mean, we'll just crash through other relationships. You know, if we don't get this one back, you know, we'll go do it to another one. If we, if we don't get the help to change. So. So you know, I'm I, I glad you one, mm -hmm. one other tool here that I found very useful, and that's daily check-ins. So it's mm -hmm. not just enough to kind of live in your own worlds on your different tracks of recovery, but you really have to connect on a daily basis and, and share your experience. And otherwise, how are you going to know kind of what, what's going on with, with the other, right? And so even if it's only 10 minutes, I think just daily check-ins 
And I, I, there's different protocols and formulas. I think it's probably a good idea to follow. But that, that kind of regular connection where you can start to practice, like what's going on with you? What share some feelings? You know, talk about talk about internal stuff. And that also is a is a marker for someone. They can kind of read. Okay, this person is actually trying to be vulnerable. Vulnerable or or sharing a feeling and that's new and that's different and so that those that's also a way to kind of uh, gauge uh, where somebody's at and the kind of work they're doing and it is very helpful without it being manipulative of see you should cut me you should want me back now so it, you know it it really needs to be you know clean on your side and pra practice with peers I mean honestly you know be joining those those drop-in groups on sex and relationship healing .com. i hope you're doing you know the the work groups those are solid you know to get a foundation and and to have accountability the the guys in those groups often create peer you know support so and because those are once a week so they're creating peer support or they're joining the drop-in groups too but they're connecting you know and, and things you know i think the work group too is so helpful from the because if i read a book you know i'll read it with my lens but if i'm hearing the facilitator yeah. and other people are discussing it, i'll go oh oh i hadn't thought about that oh i wouldn't have put that in oh that's part of my problem too you know i mean who knew so so i think it, it's it's super helpful to be um because you know, I say this all the time, if we could just read a book and be in recovery, we'd read one book and we'd all be good. And that's not how this works. You know, um, we have to learn to practice things that we, we don't, we don't know how to do. And so, but we can learn. So, you know, since it's not a question too, I just want to talk a little bit about vulnerability and, and mm -hmm. honesty because I think that's a, something else that people struggle with. And um, I think most sex addicts in recovery kind of, okay, now what? <laughs> in terms of just, well, what is, what is healthy sex and what's, what is intimacy anyway? And it's because we never really knew how to do it. And I think um, one of the ways we learn how to do it is, is with groups. You know, we talk about intimacy skills in the groups that we have at Seeking Integrity. We talk about intimacy being formed in the online work groups. And what do I mean by that? I mean, these groups of people talk about feelings and their own feelings and their own experience they're sharing, they're being vulnerable, they're sharing their, and they're giving feedback to other people. And that's all the basic building blocks of that sharing your experience, sharing your feelings. That's that's what intimacy is. And those skills are directly transferable to your, to your marriage. Uh, so we can practice intimacy skills with all these different kinds of relationships, with, with groups, with with friends, with with certainly with our spouses. So I think it's just it's a I think we have to kind of demystify intimacy somehow. It's, it's really about trusting and, and being vulnerable, which is not an easy thing for most of us because based on our you know, histories where being vulnerable is not usually a safe option for us. So we have to overcome those barriers, but, but it's certainly doable uh, in, the right, in the right format. Well, and, and practicing with the, with the drop-in groups, that's way easier you know, because it's a whole bunch of people that are, you know, whether it's the betrayed partners or it's the addicts, it's, you know, it's people that are in, a, you know, in a similar situation. So, so being able to share and then go, you know, people are going, here's some resources, here's some support, you know, and, and you go, oh, okay, that, that felt good. I, I did that now. Now I'm going to go practice that at home. Like the first question was like, okay, it's harder to do this stuff at home, but, but now I've practiced and that, you know, so, so I've tried it and now I'm going to go try it here, you know, and I mean, that's how we, you know, that's how we learn. But, you know, I mean, I think um, everything I learned, you know, people in the 12 step had to teach me because, you know, I just, I, I didn't know how to handle emotions. I didn't know how to connect. I, I, I thought of this the other day. I hadn't thought of this in so long but you know the the term that i was using in my active addiction was mutual uh, mutual use and abuse society and like there was a group like we were horrible to each other and but we, we didn't take care of ourselves and it was just like this kind of accepted thing and i thought man like i hadn't thought of that term in ages and i thought i would so not be okay i'm mean, like that like that is such a foreign concept to me now you know, so I learned, but like, it was just like, yeah, everybody uses and abuses and, you know, it just doesn't matter. Um, um, that would, that isn't who I want to be. And I'm not, I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't do that. So, so I did learn. <laughs> Send in questions, folks. It's quiet night tonight. Yeah. We usually overflow with questions. Um, 
So we have a we have a lot. We're talking about post acute withdrawal tonight, which is this kind of longer range, up to six oh. months, subtle symptoms of of uh, withdrawal. And so uh, yeah, okay, we got one. Yeah, why would an SA in residential twice now at transitional sober house want couples therapy? He only mentioned after I said he was never taking accountability for his actions, still fabricating stories, continuing to deny actions. Um, uh, even though I need accountability, is this so he can continue his addiction while appearing to be sincere and work hard work into the world? Hmm. <laughs> Well, um, let me talk about couples therapy and kind of where I see Yeah, it. please, yeah. Um, so couples therapy is, a, first of all, a really useful thing. I like to see it at a certain point in recovery. I think my, my own belief, ideally, in every case is maybe a little different, but typically I think it's best served when the addict and the partner get their own sources of recovery, whatever that means, right? Support recovery, the addict probably needs to go to treatment, may IOP, maybe ongoing transitional living for a period of time. The partner hopefully can get some support, um, get some work groups, get therapy, and each kind of have their own individual healing path, at least in the beginning. In sex addiction recovery and porn recovery, we talk about that formal disclosure, which happens a little bit down the road in recovery. And I think at that point, uh, until that point, I don't know that couples therapy is as beneficial as it is later. Now, there may be exceptions to this. This is my my feeling because both until that until this closure, both people are kind of working on their individual paths toward the same goal, right? The the formal disclosure comes together, a very formal process back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, the, hopefully, that's the foundation for healing the relationship. And at that point. I think couples therapy is probably most useful because, but what couples therapy is, the client in couples therapy is the relationship, right? So the, if I'm a therapist doing couples therapy, it's not, he's not my patient, she's not my patient, the, the relationship is the patient. And so it's totally conceivable that a, a couple in sex recovery, the he could have a CSAT, she could have a CSAT, and they could have a couples therapist. I know it gets very top heavy for, for couples therapy. But at that point, what's the purpose of couples therapy? The purpose at, at that point really is to, to work out the bugs. Couples therapists are immensely skilled at communication techniques, at working through how this, how these people talk to each other, some of the dynamics, and they're great kind of problem solvers and skill builders. And I think at that point, um, after the disclosure, couples therapy can really be very, very helpful. And in my opinion, couples therapy isn't necessarily something that goes on forever. Couples therapy is more of a short-term thing, maybe done repeatedly over time, you know, six weeks now, six weeks and six months, something like that, where you get skills, you go out and practice, you come back. But I think um, it really is a team. But I think it's important to understand that the couples therapist is not um, not an individual therapy for one or the other. And, and I think mm -hmm. sometimes, and I know it's, it's, it isn't unusual for an individual therapist to also be the couples therapist, and that can be done. Um, it just, I think you have to be really, as a therapist, have really clear boundaries and good lines about who's who and who your client is at any given moment. But, but in any case, to answer your question, I think, um, you know, I'm not, I can't say what the motivation would be here. I think, you know, seeking out additional therapy is, isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I, again, I don't know the motivation or the, or the reason why. Um, although, as I say, the, someone in transitional housing um, a sober house, uh, that's not the logical time at which I would introduce couples therapy myself. <laughs> so I'm not sure what that's about. Uh, Tammy, yeah, any late thoughts well, on that? I, yeah, I mean, I do because it, it, like we, I hear lots of people who've gone to couples therapy for years and, you know, and, and there's still all the problems. So, you know, I, I love what you're sharing. There's a specific focus. And I often say, you know, the couples therapist, the couple ship is the you know, is the client, neither of them. And it's dicey to do it, you know, where, you know, you're seeing one of them and then you're doing it. I think right. conjoint therapy where both of you have a therapist and then the two therapists are doing oh, couples work valuable. with the two of you. 
that's yeah. really helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because then they both know you and they can support you and then you can, you know, they can work on the interactions and then they can go back and help you with those particular situations. So, so I find that to be, you know, uh, uh, pretty useful, but you know, they're also the, uh, the, the other thing, um, uh, you particularly, uh, you know, I don't know what the transition is, but there could be, you know, some support from the couples therapist to help you, you know, if, if you're, if, he's coming back home like maybe it's about the transitioning back home I, d- I don't know but you know your therapist helping you with how do you hold your healthy boundaries you know with that and you know uh, helping communicate that uh, but getting a plan for how we're going to navigate this and what you know what does this look like I mean that that may be what the point of it is you know I don't know I mean I think it's uh, unfortunate I mean and, and I'm a little concerned if you if your perception is that he isn't doing the work um, and that it's just going to be about more lies, then, then I'm kind of wondering, like, you know, it, kind of what's the point, you know, is that you know, the relationship, you know, you ultimately want, because, you know, why, why do therapy if everybody's, you know, continuing on their path and lying, so. You know, I, I wonder if it might be helpful to get input from um, any kind of therapist that he's worked with or staff at these places, you know, just, I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting probably get too involved in this particular case. I don't know. So, but there's seems like there's more going on there than meets the eye. Let me just say that. Yeah. So, okay. Is long term depression a withdrawal symptom for chem sex addict or a sign of depression prior to chem sex? I am 1.5 years sober chem sex, but still working on porn addiction, 30 days sober, and suffer from mild depression. Uh, good for you, first of all. You know, um, unfortunately, the answer is both. Um, many, many people have experienced depression before they get caught up in addiction, and that can be actually a risk factor for the development of addiction. More probably, um, I would guess in the case of chemsex, we see that the whole act of chemsex is pretty destructive on what's called the dopamine transporter system in the brain, which simply put, it's just the way that brain distributes dopamine. And when we don't have dopamine distributed well, we get depressed. And, and unfortunately, chemsex, particularly amphetamines, destroy those dopamine receptors. And so you're doing kind of a functional brain injury with meth, particularly, but cocaine, even porn and sex addiction, because it's so intense, the brain does what's called dopamine down regulation. It, it's so intense that the brain actually starts to kill off its own dopamine receptors just to deal with all the dopamine to turn down the volume. So, so all these intensity addictions result in this depression once somebody gets into recovery because the brain has already adapted to the, the high volume of the addiction and the, suddenly the volume stops and the brain has already adapted. So depression can go on. Now, the, the key here from what I'm reading is that you one and a half years. The kind, of the, the kind of consequence of depression as a result of damage, as a result of the chem sex, that really resolves after about a year. So I think this may be an underlying depression that you may have. And so I'd really encourage you to see someone to, see, to get evaluated. Uh, it's very common. Uh, there's probably 30, 40% correlation of major depressive disorder with certain kinds of sex addiction and, and chem sex. So there's very, this, the, the, it's very treatable. Uh, the SSRI antidepressants, if that's what turns out to be, or Wellbutrin, there's a number of them that don't have any side effects. Um, then by, by the way, the, the, the protocol, the best practices protocol for this is um, an antidepressant combined with psychotherapy. Right, that has the best outcome as opposed to a medication just by itself. But I think just because it's gone on for a year and a half, there's no reason for you to be dragging around with depression for a year and a half. That's that's too long. And so I'd really take a look at, at doing something about that. Um, we talked tonight earlier about post acute withdrawal. The time window for that is more like six months. And the as I say, the dopamine damage from chemsex is like a, a year. Uh, so I think you're at, you're at a point where I get that checked out. There's no no need for you to walk around being depressed at that point. And as I always add, by someone who's a qualified professional, don't just go to your general GP because they don't, you know, have the addiction and they will just give you the same pill that they gave, you know, 30 other people today in their oh, office. The so, rep. Yes, exactly. It drives me yeah. crazy. So yeah, get get that 
get the right help. So, okay. Can you talk about mindful masturbation? What is it? How can it be done? Can this be part of our yellow or green circle after 90 days of sobriety from porn? Yeah. So this is a term that kind of floats around. Um, mindful. If we think about masturbation from a sex addiction point of view and what the intention of masturbation is for most sex and porn addicts, masturbation has become just a way to sort of manipulate brain chemistry, the dopamine, and, and kind of escape into fantasy. And so masturbation becomes like popping a pill. If I'm bored, I masturbate. If I'm upset, I masturbate. If I'm lonely, I'm, I'm masturbate. If I'm angry, everything becomes, masturbate, masturbation becomes a way to self-soothe. And that that is an unfortunate thing because that becomes the way we deal with everything, right? And so a lot of the challenge of recovery from sex and porn addiction is learning how to deal with those feelings without turning to masturbation. Um, mindful and masturbation is a concept more out of the sex therapy world that talks about, okay, if I'm masturbating, masturbating by in and of itself is not evil, right? Masturbation can be a healthy thing. And that mindful masturbation is the act of, of staying connected to your body as opposed to dropping into fantasy and disconnecting in, in kind of unhealthy fantasy. Now, theoretically, it's a great idea. The, the problem with it, my problem with it from a sex addiction point of view, it's like um, a slippery slope that's like almost straight down. Uh, it's very, very difficult to maintain that kind of healthy parameters around mindful masturbation for a sex or porn addict even well in recovery, and I would say well past 90 days. So I'd, I'd be very, very careful about that. Um, this is something I wouldn't do unless you talk to your CSAT about it, to your sponsor about it, um, and, and uh, be very careful. I, I've seen some chemsex users who weren't really into porn or, or sexual acting out short of the meth and, and cocaine start to look at this after maybe 90 days, I think it's too soon, six months maybe, but, but I think I just, you're playing with dynamite here. I'd be very careful. It's a concept. It's a sex therapy concept. It's not necessarily from the sex addiction world. And so I'd be really cautious about it. Um, it is out there. Now, the whole idea of masturbation, when and what, you know, that's, that's another deal. Some people have it in their inner circle. Some people don't. Um, but when to put it in there is something that's really highly individualized. But I think, it, again, it comes down to, can I maintain uh, my headspace and be in a certain frame of mind without slipping into fantasy and, and into this other space where I don't want to be. And remember, when we are active in our addiction, those pathways become hardwired so that it's not, we don't choose to drop into fantasy, we go there automatically. And so when you start to play around with masturbation or fantasy, in early recovery at least, you're going to go there automatically. And so you're going to find yourself in the middle of that fantasy, and even if you don't want to be there. And so it's a very, very powerful draw that I think I'd be very, very cautious about. Yeah, I, I was like 90 days would terrify me. Um, I would be really curious what your sponsor and um, therap qualified therapist say. Um, and, and the other thing I thought about is what are you looking for to do? You know, like, what, you know, and, and, um, you know, if it's, I'm looking to escape and, you know, numb out or whatever, you know, that's a, that's a problem. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think, um, I mean, I've heard people that, that had to call, like, if their if masturbation is on their okay list, they have to call their sponsor before they have to call their sponsor after. I mean, it's like, you know, and it gets to be like that, you know, that, um, you know, that programmed, so to speak. So, um, so I would invite you to, especially 90 days in, you know, go for a walk, go for, go do something else. Go, yeah, go to a twin set There's you know? ways of yeah. connect with your body and mind with mindful meditation and stuff. Um, yeah, <laughs> be cautious. Okay. Last question is, when I get an urge to act out, it builds up intensity higher and higher. It does go away, but it's really uncomfortable to go through. Are there ways to dissipate it early? Distraction only makes it go for a moment and it comes back. It's like it needs to run its course. Great question. And you're right. I mean, any kind of trigger craving is like a wave. It's going to build and build and build. And on that upward ride, it's going to be like unbearable. I can't stand it, but it does peak and, and go down. Distraction is a major way we do it, right? That, that's a, a great way to help. What I would use um, more powerful maybe is use your, use breathing, breath, use your body. So breathe something like four, four, seven, eight breathing, which is 
inhale for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. And any kind of breathing exercise, the way that you always want to have the out breath longer than the in breath, that triggers a, a relaxing response from your body. But if you could do that like four, seven, eight, four times, that really does a shift. It does a couple of things. One, it distracts you because you're counting breaths. So it's doing that too, but it's also physiologically shifting your body in a way that relieves that pressure. So I, I definitely try the breathing technique on top of it. I actually, we talked about sleep earlier. I actually use that for sleep too, that the four, seven, yes, eight breathing, because if my brain is going, woo, and I do the four, seven, eight, yeah. it takes like two minutes and I'm usually asleep shortly thereafter. So like, it really is very calming and refocusing. So I would, I would encourage that, but, but yeah, yeah. And it, it almost is like the distraction, but you know, it's the elephant in the room. And then I think about it again. So, so, um, right. uh, right. you know, I, I love, I love the mindfulness breathing, especially because it's two minutes, you know, I'm bad at the 20 minute, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so Dr. David, thank you so much. Thanks for all the questions, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, lots of great me. resources free on sex and relationship and uh, check out the work groups and things. I put the link in the chat too, for uh, like the couple's healing from betrayal starts. Uh, Dr. Susie LeBrock does a great job with that starts again. Uh, May 5th, but lots of, you know, the sex addiction 101, porn addiction 101, betrayed partners, lots of good stuff on there. So thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks, Tammy. Good night. Bye-bye.